So today, SRAM have gone live with a host of significant new product updates. We're down here in Tasmania at the Medina Bike Park and we're joined by Chris Mandel from SRAM Global, who's gonna give us a run through of all of the parts and give us some of the sort of intel and design cues that they did behind the scenes in developing this super exciting gear. But before we get into that, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to our channel, give it a like, and if you've got any questions, drop me below, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Now, Chris, where do we begin? There's a lot to talk about, but I think we should probably get started with the, the part of the bike we used to call a drive chain. Yeah, I think that's a really good place to start. Um, you know, I think for us, this is a really good opportunity to kind of take a step back and realize what we're asking our bikes to do. Pedal uphill, go downhill, smash berms left and right. And we also want them to be really easy to set up and we want them to last a long time. So our engineers in Germany and all across the world spent a bunch of time trying to make it really easy to set up and super durable. Right. Mate, run us through some of the biggest, like it's still Axis, so it's still completely wireless, digital, uh, or electronic, should we say. Um, but mate, that derailleur is night and day different to what we've seen in the previous generation. Give us a run through of some of the highlights and, and some of the changes you guys decided to make and why you decided to make them. Yeah, so I would say actually the whole system is completely different from anything else you've seen before, yeah. and that's why we're going forward with calling it a transmission. The cassette and the derailleur are an integrated system, so the cassette is pushing up against the derailleur so that the derailleur knows exactly where the cassette is. Um, we're removing a ton of complexity. There's no more high and low limit screws. There's no more B-bolt adjustment. To put this kit on your bike, you prepare the parts, so you put the cassette on, you pair the access system just like you would on a normal access system. Um, and then you hang everything on there, um, and then you tighten things up in a certain sequence, and once you've tightened them up, that's it, you're done. Man, that's epic. And so Chris, one of the first things that we noticed, like obviously we're out here at Medina Bike Park, uh, we're focusing on descending, but the first riding we did was halfway up the hill much to JT's delight and um, you really wanted us to focus on this initially because one of the biggest differences is actually shifting under load. This is not something that we've really considered before like out of our, or expected out of our componentry was to be able to just mash up the gears under full load and it felt very very foreign initially and I was scared <laughs> like just jumping on this brand new bike but I was genuinely, I still am genuinely blown away after a couple of days of riding just how much force you can put through these pedals, like under full shifting, like just mashing up that cassette. Uh, obviously this has been a big uh, part, like in the thought process of redesigning, like is that all that's going on though? Is that the, the biggest and only change? Yeah, no, I would say, I mean, there, the, the, gear, the ability to mash through gears and, and you experience that on an analog bike, imagine what that's mm. like on a, a full on e-bike in turbo mode and you're slamming gears. Um, that was definitely one of the things that we wanted to accomplish. Ease of setup, you know, like setup is a huge place where a drivetrain can let the rider down. If the, if the drivetrain isn't set up properly, that means that the rider is going to have a bad day out there. So we really wanted to spend a bunch of time and energy making setup super easy. Um, and then durability is a huge thing for us. Mm -hmm. Like we want you to be able to smash this derailleur. We want it to be really strong. We wanted to integrate the derailleur into the rear axle system so that it was very strong and very well supported. Throwing out what we've had in the past with derailleur hangers that would bend, allowing your derailleur to go right into your rear wheel, which is not a place for a <laughs> rear derailleur. That's a good way to end your ride real quick. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll put a stopper to it. Um, but we also wanted to have that ability to smash gears because you shouldn't have to adapt your pedaling and your riding to your transmission, to your drivetrain, to how you're getting up the hill. Um, so that was really, really important to us. And there's no one detail that has gotten us there. There are tons of little tiny tweaks here and there that get us to the finish line on that. That ability to shift under load is going to be a huge advantage on e-bikes and we know that this group set, or one of the levels of this group set is rated for e-bikes, is that right? Yeah, so uh, actually both, two out of the three um, options that we will provide are e-bike rated. So the EXO group that's in front of us right now 
um, is totally fine to use on an e-bike. And then the XX group that we will offer, which is a tier above this, is also um, totally fine to use on an e-bike. It's the XXSL group that we don't recommend for um, powered um, systems, light e-bikes or full powered e-bikes. That makes a lot of sense. Um, mate, tell us a bit about the derailleur in sort of breaking it down. Now, we learned that it's modular. Um, it's got some really impressive pieces you can replace to keep it fresh. Uh, essentially built in bash guards or armory, some of you have never seen a derailleur before. Tell us a bit about the thought process behind that and how you managed to achieve it. Yeah, totally. So again, this goes back to that durability side of it is like we're really looking to have a transmission on your bike that can take a bunch of hits and keep on going without inhibiting your ability to ride. But we also know that you want your stuff to look really fresh. So one of the things that we've done with this is we've made a bunch of the components on the exterior of the rear derailleur replaceable so that you can scuff and hit them on things. And these are obviously more the points of contact for the rear derailleur. So we studied a lot of what is gonna hit the ground, what's gonna hit a rock on the side of the trail, what's gonna get scratched and scuffed up. And we've put skid plates in those places and made them replaceable as well. We know that the cage, whilst we've made this cage very durable and super as strong as we possibly can, we also know that that's a thing that can get mangled from time to time. So it's very easy to replace the entire cage assembly on a derailleur. You don't even have to take your chain off of your bike. Yeah, right. That is not to achieve that. But probably one of the things you notice first is how little mass of that derailleur body actually sits outboard. This thing is like really vast majority of the derailleur body in all gears is, is, is in a, like, a vertical line with the drop out of the bike. How have you guys achieved that? Yeah, so again, there's, I mean, there's so many little details that kind of come into this, but you know, we, we are using the full mount for this derailleur. So this derailleur mounts in place of where a UDH hanger used to be. So if you have a UDH equipped bike, which there are hundreds and hundreds of models available out on the market today, you have a UDH equipped bike, what you do is you would take that UDH derailleur hanger off of your bike and give it to a buddy or throw it in the trash and then you would mount this derailleur up in place of it. And what that means is the derailleur is very securely and firmly mounted to your frame. It also means that because we're so close to your frame and so tucked in there, we're able to move the derailleur quite a bit underneath the frame and tuck it in nicely. It also means that the derailleur and your rear axle are directly integrated to each other, which makes an entire super strong system because your rear derailleur, your rear axle, and the whole back end of your frame are now one structural entity that can take huge amounts of impact. Right. And also, you've got the, I mean, Shams would be known for having a crisp shift in, in my opinion. And now it's just so much closer together, it's, it's even, it's on a, whole new level again of precision, right? Yeah, totally. So, you know, as I mentioned, the cassette and the derailleur are up against each other. So the cassette's mounted to the free hub, which has an end cap, and that sits up directly against the rear derailleur. So the rear derailleur knows exactly where the cassette is. The rear derailleur also does not flex at all out of the way as the derailleur's trying to shift itself up in, up the cassette, mm. um, which is just one of the little details that leads to that really crisp and really um, confidence-inspiring shifting under load. 100%. And I think the, the reduction in interfaces there, like derailleur hanger to frame, derailleur hanger to derailleur itself, like you've just regained a whole lot of control over the quality and the fitment of all the components. Yeah. Obviously, we can't control, well, SRAM can't control the quality of the frame itself, but that's gotten a lot better over the last few years across the board. And the fact that now you guys have control over the entire mounting system, it's just, it's a game changer as far as how effective the shifting is. Yeah, and, I, and our OEM partners have come along with us on this and, you know, we worked with them on the UDH standard and we worked on making sure that that was a derailleur hanger that was going to work and, and provide them with a lot of benefits. Um, but we also work with them on the, the fitment of everything else that had to come along to get us to this point. Um, you know, I know you have, work a lot in like the engineering space and you know and understand tolerance stack up and when you stack a bunch of tolerances, yeah. things start getting a little loose and what we're really doing here in a lot of ways is eliminating that tolerance stack because 
the cassette again and the derailleur are right next to each other and they know exactly where they are in space and it allows us to provide a better performing system. It sounds like such a common sense approach to, to a drivetrain, which is obviously got a lot of moving parts, quite complex. Um, you're adding a ton of durability, adding a ton of precision. You guys really knocked it out of the ballpark, I would say. Now, we've mentioned already that the new uh, transmission is coming in three levels. Um, tell us, a, like, let's break down some of the, I guess, individual components. Tell us a bit about the rear cassette. We're staying 12 speed, we're still 10 to 52 tooth. Um, but those steps are a little bit different. Um, and also there's a, there's a red ring in the middle there. Tell us a bit about that as well. Yeah, totally. So the cassette is still a 12 speed cassette. We did tweak the gear steps a bit in there. Um, the cassette is also pretty, we, you know, a couple different layer, layers in terms of construction of them. But I do think, and this goes back to a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of durability and ship performance, the big changes to the cassette really are showing up in that space. Um, so, with the exception of one cog on the cassette, this cassette is narrow wide. So you have meshing um, exactly between the narrow and the wide plates of your chain, with the exception of the cog that you mentioned with the red ring on it. That's what we call the setup cog. So we've touched on this a little bit, but this the setting up of this system is quite different from anything that's been out there before in that all you do is hang the parts on the bike, tighten everything up in a certain sequence, and then you're off to the races, and you're done. But that red cog we call out, and it's again the only one that's on a narrow wide cog, and that's just to make it a little bit easier for you, because you literally just have to drop the chain on that one. Um, you drop the chain on there, and that's the place that you start your um, tightening of the, the whole system to get the proper setup. So it's called the setup cog. As if it wasn't already easy enough to set up access, it's literally click of a finger. Like we set it up on, on my bike within a matter of maybe five minutes. Yeah. And that's me walking you through and showing you yeah. everything you do. When you've done it a couple of times, it's literally poof, you're done. That's yeah. Um, I would feel very comfortable walking someone who had never turned a wrench mm. through yeah. the installation of this drivetrain over the phone. No, not no. even FaceTime. <laughs> Um, you know me, I'm a bit of a visual guy, I love my things looking Gucci, and one of the things that absolutely jumps out to me is that chain, yeah. that, that flat top or that flat bottom, whatever you, whichever way you're looking at it. Um, tell us a bit about that chain, that's something we haven't seen in mountain biking before, yeah. um, apart from looking epic. Uh, there's a bunch of performance upgrades there, as, or performance elements there as well. Um, yeah, man, give us a little run through the chain. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have we, we have had flat top chains on the road for quite a while now. It's a really good way to get a stiff, strong chain out of the system. You're putting material where it needs to be and removing it um, from where you, where you need to remove it to get, get a high performance shift. Um, it is a different chain from what we offer on the road, so there aren't cross compatible. Um, we did a, a bit more to this one just because it's going to see mountain use rather than uh, that, rather than on the road. And then it is optimized for the narrow wide um, profiling on the cassette and on the on the front wing. Yeah, good. So speaking of that front wing, we've got some uh, bash guards mounted up there. This is something that you and I also sort of came together on, and there's just not enough of that type of bike protection like we're going crazy for down tube protection and and these types of things but I really love that there's a, a couple of bash guards and they're mounted in a very svelte way they're looking really really streamlined um, so there's a couple different models between the different spec levels um, but basically that's a that's a modular part as well isn't it that's yep. not part of the chain ring. yeah totally so this bike um, this is an XO bike it has um, polycarbonate bashes on it um, it, this bike is currently mounted up with both bashes, but you could take both bashes off or you could have one on. So if you're a left foot forward person, you could just run that lower one. Um, the XX crank um, features an aluminum version of this bash um, and is the same setup. You can mount, you can put it on or take it off. Um, and the chain ring is designed to take the kinds of loads we expect to see mm. from impacts like that. Right. I mean, I'm always been a carbon fiber crank kind of guy. I just think it's awesome. But to be honest, I reckon this has to be the nicest aluminum crank I've ever seen in my life. 
Uh, visually, awesome. Uh, but it's actually got an extremely unique design. Now you're gonna have to get in close to have a good look at that. Um, but tell us a bit about some of the design cues of this crank and some of those benefits that they provide. Yeah, totally. So you have to remember back a little ways back, but there was some news stories that came out a couple of years ago about SRAM and Autodesk partnering on some 3D printed crank arms. And what it was was uh, a computer aided drafted computer-aided drafting um, system that used AI to optimize the material placement on a system. And so for a crank arm, we basically had to tell the computer where the loads were gonna go into the system, and it would output a different bunch of different options to optimize the, the design. And then you would sort of select the best one that worked for what you wanted to do, and then off to the races. Now what we did with Autodesk at the time wasn't a practical item for production. It was 3D printed, it was it was sort of designed to be a one-off. But we took the learning from that Autodesk um, AI experience and we rolled that up into these XO cranks to optimize their weight and strength um, for what for what we're doing. So these are incredibly strong and incredibly light cranks. They're um, ridiculous really, really proud. They're yeah, they're and very stiff. Light. And very stiff. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Now the one thing we haven't yet touched on uh, as part of the transmission, and I'm gonna have to say it's easily my favorite part. Um, it's certainly the thing that probably feels most natural, and that's probably because it's a contact point. This design of the new trigger or shifter, or what are we gonna call it? Absolutely nuts. We could talk about this thing for hours, but let's just briefly touch on some of the things you've achieved there, um, and yeah, what the people watching the video can expect when they get to see this in real life and, and use it for themselves. Yeah, so we call it a pod, um, and when you look at it closely, you'll see why we call it a pod. Um, we are really excited about what we've been able to pull off with this um, new shifter, um, new controller. The idea really is to just be able to give the end user exactly what they want. So adjustability and positioning was sort of king for us on this one, um, and we want you to be able to move that thing around and get it right into the place where you want it so that you can with as minimal input and as minimal thought get into the gear or dropper post position that you want to be um one other thing i've noted on this is it's actually inner the pods are the same left to right so um that does mean during setup you need to make sure you pair the right shifter before you pair the left shifter um and but it, it's a huge advantage in terms of just we're using the same parts on either side of the bar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The ergonomics of the new design was just night and day compared to the old one. And I like the initial, the original uh, axis shifter, but this was just straight away. Like it was, it was like it was made for my hand. Almost. Yeah. Like it was really good as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It literally, like it felt telling me. That was the first thing I was like, holy moly. Like, every time I went to grab a gear, it just felt like, I didn't have to give it a second thought. And, and we, we, we actually haven't, <coughs> um, with either one of you yet, um, worked on optimizing the buttons, but we yeah. do actually have two button options, yeah. so you can replace the buttons. We've been using the flat button, um, but we have a, a concave button as well that you can use and change out to further optimize your experience. Now, one of the things Chris just mentioned there is that the um, pod features two buttons, um, and he also mentioned, if you're paying attention, that the pods are the same on both sides. Now, that means... You have two buttons on the left-hand side. Traditionally, that would be where we have one button and we have the dropper post. Um, but having two buttons actually unlocks a ton of new customization features. Uh, tell us some of the stuff that you can be rocking over there on the left-hand side that you couldn't have previously. Well, it's really whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, if you want to have the dropper post on the right side, all both buttons on the right side, you can do that. If you want to have ETAP style shifting where it's um, up the cassette on the left and down the cassette on the right, you can do that too, and then have both of your upper buttons be your dropper seat post. It's totally configurable within the app, and you can you can do whatever you want. So, so last year we saw some updates uh, in the suspension, and we really saw some ultimate products. Uh, we noticed that we've actually got ultimate up on the lever now. So we've got code ultimates, and they're a pretty futuristic looking uh, design lever body up there. Just run us through a few of those new features and what the idea behind the redesign on that was. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I think I think everyone's gotten used to 
two cables in front of their bikes with two brakes. And I think these levers are an, an opportunity for us to further clean up the aesthetic of the handlebar. So the lines run much closer to where your handlebar was before and they're able to go back into the into either the head tube of your frame or, or your external cable routing just to provide the rider with a much cleaner cockpit aesthetic. Um, we are um, we are going to offer another level of code. So as you mentioned, there's a code ultimate, which will have a carbon lever. Um, but we are also bringing in another couple, uh, a few more pairs of brakes along for this, um, or along with this. So we'll also have a level four piston um, caliper um, with what we call stealth brake levers. Um, and we're really excited about those. They're actually lighter than our previous generation level um, two piston. And then we'll have a two piston um, level brake in, that's available in the stealth style as well. Mate, beyond the visuals of the lever and obviously the angling of the cable, which cleans everything up even more than just only having two cables, which is awesome. Um, there was a bit of a different, like subtle, feel to the lever, like performance feel I found over the previous generation code. Um, tell us a bit about what's going on inside that lever and some of the, uh, I guess some of the features that the, the consumer is going to get when they get to experience these new levers for the first time and, uh, and yeah, the extra power I guess that you are, you're going to be getting out there on the trail. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think we're really happy with where code is today, like in terms of level of, in terms of performance, power, um, lever feel, all that kind of thing. But we are constantly evolving things. So there isn't any one thing to point to in these levers that's like resulting in the on-trail experience that you had versus the previous version of code. But we are always tweaking things. We're always moving forward. And every time we do something new, it's an opportunity to improve the process of manufacturing and improve the system that we're working on. So in terms of power and performance, these things should be along the lines of what we're doing with code today, but of course, we're always making things a little bit better here and there. I can imagine, I can imagine. So that's our wrap up of SRAM's latest offering. There's an absolute ton of new stuff. Uh, we've got the brakes, we've got the transmission uh, in a bunch of various families and levels. Um, definitely plenty to be excited and definitely a lot that you guys are going to want to check out. Now, we're going to be coming at you very shortly with an in-depth review of this stuff. We've given you an overview and soon we'll tell you exactly how it performs with all of our trail notes. Stay tuned to our channel. Chris, thank you once again. Thanks for we'll having me. We'll be playing on us soon.